Wonderful. Um, welcome back, everyone, for uh, this final session where we're going to have a panel discussion on informatics and digital health research um, as we contemplate um, our place in the world. Um, to facilitate this discussion is Professor Jeffrey Braithwaite, who is the founding director of the Australian Institute for Health Innovation. Jeffrey is also the director for the health the Center for Healthcare Resilience and Implementation Science, and he's a professor of health systems research here at Macquarie University. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Thank you, Farah. So colleagues, at no expense being spared, the cream of informaticians in Australia outside of the Center for Health Informatics <laughs> are here before you. What a treat. By the way, a word about you, the audience. It always occurs to me that when you're in the last session of the day, there's a characteristic about who's left that is intriguing. <laughs> you are either dedicated and driven or desperate and dateless. <laughs> I'm not quite sure which. <laughs> By the way, as well, Enrico, I forgot what you said to me what the instructions were. Was it that you wanted me to pose the most challenging questions possible to this panel, risking shredding their reputation by not being able to answer, <laughs> or to elicit from their expertise and have an interesting journey of interaction with the audience? I'm not quite sure, but we're gonna find out in about an hour's time, aren't we? <laughs> We'll find out in an hour's time. So, thank you, Farah, for the introduction. Let's hear from the panel. Online, we have David Hansen. David, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm David Hansen. I lead CSRO's Digital Health Research Program, the Australian e Health Research Centre. And I'm really sorry that I'm not there in person. Uh, COVID strikes again. We wish you well, David, and we know you'll perform regardless of having COVID, but we hope you'll get well soon. Now the panel, let's hear from the panel. Professor Wendy Chapman, identify and introduce yourself, please. Wendy Chapman, I direct the Center for Digital Transformation of Health at the University of Melbourne. And I, you can tell from my accent, I'm from the US, moved here from the state of Utah. That wasn't guaranteed, actually. We sometimes say in Australia, you're from North America. Yeah. <laughs> People always ask me if you're from Canada. And you that say yes. just shocked me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Associate Professor Claire Sullivan. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I head up the Digital Health Research Network at University of Queensland, and I'm also an endocrinologist at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. Sounds like two jobs, Claire. Mm. <laughs> Associate Professor Adam Dunn. Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Dunn. I look after biomedical informatics and digital health at the University of Sydney, and I'm also the convener of the Digital Health and Informatics Network at the University. Thank you. And Dr. Louise Schaefer. Yes, I am the CEO of the Australasian Institute of Digital Health. I uh, trained as an occupational therapist, and I have a PhD in informatics, but just, just a doctor on this panel. So <laughs> these are way more accomplished informaticians than me. When you're in a powerful position like yours, you're not just a doctor. <laughs> so let's kick off. Let's hear from you. I've been thinking as you have about what unfolded today from the time when the vice chancellor spoke all the way through to now. So I think it was Debussy, my favorite French, French um, a composer, who said music is the space between the notes. So what's the future gaps for health informatics over the next 10 years that you think Kai and other researchers might fill across the next 10 years? Who'd like to start? You're looking at me. I can start. I wish I could give a poetry um, response to that, but I, I will fail miserably if I try. Um, where I see it's actually not about topics, it's about the rest of the healthcare sector actually understanding the work that you do here and the work that these fine academics do. It annoys me and frustrates me no end when you see governments across the world um, and 
individual healthcare sector, like it, it goes all the way down where people are repeating the same mistakes and they're not learning from history. They have no idea, they've never picked up a medical informatics journal before. So I think if we really want to make a difference, that's the gap that we need to fill is actually looking at how we can work collectively as a, sec as a sector to make sure that people understand what we do, they value it, and that they use the information that comes out of research centres like Chai. Wendy? Great. I will say that last mile of how to really implement AI and other digital interventions that we're developing, because there's so many unanswered questions about the workflow, about integrating it into the existing uh, systems, about how to bring patients to the table and co-designing and, and, and helping you know, develop that participatory help. And so really um, figuring out ways to co-design and validate um, the innovations. David Hanson. Ah, thank you. Um, two fine answers so far. Uh, I'm going to add mine, which is around lowering the barriers, um, and whether that's for patients or doctors, but maybe doctors in particular, uh, maybe the health systems. But it's about lowering the lowering the barriers to the easy, or to making it easier <coughs> for the introduction of digital health. Um, so that it almost becomes invisible. So the informatics challenges is how do we just make it part of, of, of how health is delivered. That's very interesting. I'm going to come back to you on this, Claire. Let's finish off this first burst of intellectual input, and then I'm going to come back to you on a couple of things. Um, I think that we have been very focused on transferring information. So shifting information from the consumer to the provider, from the provider to the residential aged care facility. We've become a little bit stuck in sorting that out. So I'd like to see a little bit less of moving information around and a bit more on computing that information. So rather than just connecting up our healthcare system, which undeniably we need to do, what is our plan for then computing with that information? And then lastly, how do we create new models of care using that computed information? Very nice. Adam? Uh, well, I mean, all of those answers were really good. I think one of the things that's missing um, is probably training at every level. Um, and so what I mean by that is um, training for undergraduates before they enter a health profession, training for people who are in health professions, training for people who come from engineering and want to understand how to manage and deal with health data. And so I think if we could increase the amount of training that we have in the sector, um, the, all of the kinds of innovations that we might see in the future will probably come about um, naturally. Haven't you all done something, though, that can't be done? If the pandemic's taught us anything, it's the future is discontinuous. There are things that happen in the next 10 years that we can't foresee. Yet I said, what should we do in the next 10 years? And you all cheerfully gave me an answer. <laughs> so how do we protect ourselves from what we don't know, the unknown unknowns of Rumsfeld, of which the pandemic, although every public health physician knew there was gonna be a pandemic, they just didn't know when. But how do we protect ourselves from that? Because you've all cheerfully given an answer about what the future must consist of if we're gonna get informatics done well. Who'd like to have a go at that? I'm just pushing back and challenging you a bit further. I have a random number generator, <laughs> and it's come up with the name Claire. <laughs> um, I love that, Jeffrey, because I think what has happened is that uh, change is our new normal. And so we actually have to accept as a sector that setting and forgetting is no longer fit for purpose. And the idea that we need to be a learning healthcare system has not been illustrated more sharply than over the last three years. So I actually think um, I'm very comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think we all need to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because we don't know. But what we do have is data, compute power, and very, very smart people to help us predict and prevent adverse outcomes for the system. So I think I can't pr predict, but um, hopefully we can prevent. David, are you sitting there with COVID at the moment, <laughs> uncomfortable? At being comfortable? Uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable. I knew I got that the wrong way around. That was just a um, test if you were all. Yes? 
Yeah, look, uh, Claire's right. I think change is the new normal. Uh, but I also think that change will be um, uneven. And so, you know, an important part of being a learning, of, of going into this uh, world of being a learning healthcare system is to learn from each other. And um, b because, um, you know, we, we see that health systems make big investments in, in you know, electronic health records or in introducing a new model of care or whatever. And almost inevitably, those investments, um, while we think, or, or maybe pe some people think, that that's going to solve everything, they, they inevitably don't and they lead to other problems. And so we have to be ready to, A, learn from each other so that when we see someone else implement the change that we're implementing or, or we're looking to implement, let's learn from it, learn from that experience so that we don't make the same mistakes. Several of you have said learning. Wendy, I know your passion for the learning health system. Is that a flexible enough and generic enough model that that's where we fold in the discomfort of not knowing how the world's going to be in 10 years' time, but be able to work productively towards a better future? I think it is, but it's probably too flexible and generic. How do you really accomplish it? It can be accomplished in so many different ways and it's such a big thing. And I, I read an interesting paper, I can't remember who wrote this, it was about the 60, 30, 10. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent reading. Keep going, Wendy, yes. Well, and you know, 30% 30, 30 of healthcare is waste. And when I look at the affiliated um, health services to the University of Melbourne, and I'm trying to figure out how to help you know, uplift them and supercharge them and help them become more of a learning health system. I see so much, even, even their, their vision for the future is fragmented and wasteful. And it's, uh, I talked to the CEO of Royal Melbourne last week and she said, yeah, I, I picture it, it's, it's, you know, the Department of Neurology is gonna have a programmer and, and the cardiology is gonna have a programmer. And they're just picturing it, these little fiefdoms, this fragmentation, and we're just not going to get there. We need platforms. We need, you know, teams. We need to be working together. We need the quality team, the research teams. You know, like everyone working together, imbe embedded in the health service, and bring research and practice together. And if if we're going to accomplish it, Louise, does that fit into your model? Your oh, absolutely, absolutely. I don't think there's anything that we need to protect. If we think that it's okay for us to maintain a static position, then you don't deserve to be here in 10 years. The entire point of our entire discipline is about foreseeing what's happening in the future and making sure that we're ahead of those things and we're bringing people along that journey. It's, it's, we don't have anything to protect right now. We have massive opportunity. For 40 years, we've been talking amongst ourselves going, we know lots of stuff, isn't this good? And look, I just I uncovered new stuff with my research. And we've been talking amongst ourselves and making significant gains that aren't being used because we do hear all the time a health service thinking that, well, I bought Epic, I bought Cerner, isn't that it? Job done. Like, so that's where we have failed and that's the opportunity now because everybody wants what you guys all have. You just have to work out how we can work together to get that information out there to really make change. You've got my heart, but I'm not sure if you've got my head. Yeah. I understand the principle is None of us is as smart as all of us working together, that we need to stitch up the boundaries between us. But the most famous book, apart from the books we put out in the <laughs> institutes, the most famous book in the last 60 years was Sid Sachs's A Strife of Interests Masquerading as a Set of Principles, his book on healthcare. 60 years ago, I think it is now. If I look at the health system, despite the work we do, the research we do, it's a whole lot of vested interests. In fact, you can drop off the word vested. It's a whole lot of interests, all pursuing their own objectives. How are we going to do that? Adam Dunn. Easy. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to quickly go back to your point about unknown. That's a so, good maneuver. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, obviously, if we want to build a, a system that is resilient, we need training. And that was my first answer, is that we need everybody to be digitally literate so that they can um, adapt and, and be resilient when it happens. But there's something more important than that. We were talking about access to data and having access to data and plopping in Epic or Cerner into these systems. And in New South Wales at the moment, we're considering a, a, a single patient record for all the patients in, in New South Wales. 
Now consider if, if, let's say, they go, well, let's just put in Cerna. That'll be our record for everyone. Everyone will just use Cerner and that'll be great. Well, that's a problem because if we really want a resilient system, we need to be able to instrument that system properly. And we can't instrument the system and measure the data that we have if we don't have access to that data in simple, fair, safe ways. And we won't be able to do that unless we follow along with what the United States already did in terms of um, making sure that bulk extract of data is simple and a requirement by law for all new health IT. If we don't do that in New South Wales now, we don't do that in Australia in the very near future, we won't be able to instrument the system and we won't have a resilient system in the future. Can we just take a slightly different tack on this then? You've got me intrigued, you've got the audience intrigued. You're suggesting that there are ways to the future and things we should do, but where's research gonna fit in if we already know what it is that's the map to the future? Should we just stop doing research and all wander over and try and help the people in the system fix the system? A bit like flying the A380 while we're fixing it in mid-flight. Should we stop being researchers and start to help fix the system. That's one real serious possibility. We probably don't need to do much more research to know what we need to do to sort the system out. It's what you just described. Mm. Aren't you doing us out of a job? No, no, oh, can I raise my hand? Wendy, you want to <laughs> respond to that, surely? Yes, yes, we should be moving over and helping them, but the key is that nobody knows how to do it. And so we need to be, as researchers, working hand in hand with the health services in an agile way to be testing out and co-designing new models of care and so that, so, because there's so many unanswered questions about how to really make it happen, even you know, in what Adam's describing that, that's so important about having access to the data. It's Did you still, say, even what Adam said? <laughs> Well, especially, <laughs> especially what Adam said is a better response. Yeah, yes. that's exactly true. But how do you do that? And once you have that data, now you know there's so many unanswered questions, and it's a research mindset and processes that are needed, but in a more agile way than is often done. Adam wants to come back. So I mean, we, we're already starting to do this. So when I first moved to the University of Sydney, we set it up so that there was a, a Department of Biomedical Informatics and Digital Health, and that we had affiliate faculty members that come from the local health districts, the PHNs, eHealth. And so we now have people who sit in our research groups, who can attend our research clinics, who are from that area. And we meet and talk to them routinely, and we submit fund, co-funding uh, grants together with them. So, so in all of the grants that I've submitted in the last sort of 12 months, they've all been industry collaboration. So they have in-kind support, they may have cash support, um, but all of them involve industry and um, are designed to um, make it easier to implement and evaluate. And we talked a little bit before about um, you know, the, the importance of implementation. I think what we need is a crack evaluation and implementation SWAT team that's already funded and sits there available um, so that every time a hospital or a LHD or a clinic decide that they want to implement something new, that that team is sitting there ready to go with the resources that they need to be able to design appropriate research um, studies to be able to measure those things. Um, we don't have that at the moment. Every time you want an evaluation done, you have to assemble a team. <coughs> we don't have that crack SWAT team of evaluation implementation that we really, really need. Not just assemble a team. You've got to get it funded, you've got to assemble a team, you've got to get governance, you've got to get ethics, you've got to get, meanwhile, the world keeps spinning. Can, it's a serious problem, isn't it? Can I add to that? Because I completely agree. Michael Kidd's, one of the things he said this morning in his great speech was, we're not including evaluation, we should be. It's like people, maybe some procurement processes are forgetting evaluation, but most of them don't want anything evaluated because they've, they've got a set pool of money to achieve, to buy pieces of software, to roll it out, whatever it might is. That's it, job done. As long as I'm measuring my success by the fact that I, um, I met that goal of that rollout of that project. We're not, so there's 
There's a really important role for research and academia to um, not just work with the, with the health services, and I love that model, Adam, it works really well, but actually to work with government and look at policy levers. We have to change procurement rules so that if you're going to get a million dollars of funding to do something in your health service, evaluation has to be part of it. And that's not going to change overnight, but universities should be lobbying, um, you know, and together with our organisation to make those changes happen. Otherwise, you're always going to be sitting outside the system where decisions get made, and it's not good enough. There's a challenge with that, though. Yeah. Um, I remember when I I'm used to go and I was working in landscape ecology, and I visited Sao Paulo, um, and there was a chemical engineering group who were who were funded very well um, to do. Um, sustainability and environmental research. And the reason why was because the petroleum industry in Brazil had to spend 1% of their GDP on environmental research. And so if we dictated, you know, these companies or these initiatives have to spend a certain proportion of it, of course, it's just gonna to go to the evaluation that's gonna say it's wonderful, um, it's cheap, it's fantastic, it's profitable, go for it. And so those, those, that evaluation needs to be independent. Absolutely, 100%. David, it's always harder when you're on a screen. By the way, you're, a, you're like on a huge screen <laughs> overlooking us all. It looks I very can see that authoritative. I, I, I'm overlooking. Um, I'll, I'll, um, uh, so, so I think where I'll add there is um, uh, around Louise's point around you know, procurement rules and things. So um, it's not just in um, evaluation and implementation that we really need to make sure that um, you know we, we put the right frameworks in place and, and you know I think uh, Wendy alluded or Adam actually alluded to what's happening in the United States with um, with the mandating that data um, you know can be a bulk ex export that data follows patients uh, as they move from hospital to hospital and that um, <clears throat> and, and that data is available to patients. And I think they're all things that we, we really need to start looking at in Australia, along with things like implementation and evaluation. So, um, you know, there's a lot we, we've got to go um, in Australia and uh, um, you know, we need to get going on it. Okay, so let's push this, a little, this journey that we're on, this, this exploration one a bit further. So how are we gonna handle the knowledge, so we've talked about informatics and evaluation and, uh, and um, doing more research to try and improve the system, but we've got the knowledge explosion occurring simultaneously. 28 million papers in PubMed, 11 systematic reviews published every day, 75 randomized trials published every day. You know the volume. How do we sift, I know Kai's had a go at this um, and, and made great progress, but how do we sift through all of that to know what sort of knowledge to put in the hands of people? And that's only the stuff in PubMed. What about all the, what are we up to? Teraflops or gigabytes or whatever, you know, all the information that's produced by genomics, by inpatient statistics collection. How do we put the right information in the right hands at the right time to make good decisions? It's all right to talk about health informatics and medical informatics. How do we actually give people the, in Claire, you're a clinician and an informatician? Uh, and a magician. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been thinking a lot about this lately and I think we have to accept that the amount of knowledge a practicing clinician needs now exceeds the human neural network. And that's actually a, a pretty radical thought for medical schools. So let's rethink how we're training our clinicians. Let's, let's teach them and tell them that fact up front. So I don't want you to know the 15 causes of peripheral neuropathy. I want you to know where to go to find the latest list of causes. And rather than um, say, this is the quantum of knowledge you need to become a doctor, I actually think we should say these are the skills that you need in 2050 to be an excellent doctor. And that would include the ability to interrogate reliable information sources, to think critically, to apply those new thoughts into your workflow, to incorporate predict, prevent analytics into your routine care and keep learning. So it'd be very clear at the end of your degree that you don't know everything that, it, that you need to know to become a doctor, but you've got the skills to become a doctor who learns. So teaching people to be very good at information seeking 
skills. Correct. I can do that, I've got Google. I think that the point and the phrase I had in there, Jeffrey, was critically appraise. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> Continue the story, Wendy. Is that, is that, do you yeah. share that view? Are you on that pathway? I definitely share that view and I would add to it that um, we need to be creating computable knowledge, guidelines, whether they're um, you know, decision support systems, that are helping analyze all that data and turning it into information and into knowledge and is actionable. And to reduce the variation that we see in the treatment of patients, the unwarranted variation through, through, that, uh, through those guidelines. All right, that's fantastic. I'm just gonna change the topic slightly and let's have a case study and see if we can sort that out between us. <laughs> Before I do that though, I'm just gonna prime the audience. We've probably got time to build in some questions from the audience, um, but let me do that in about five minutes or so. Just getting the people who are good at maneuvering the microphones primed to be able to do that at the right time. <laughs> this is like coordination in front of a whole bunch of people and hoping it's all gonna work out well. <laughs> So let's, uh, I'm mindful of many of the interesting things that people said during the course of today, but one really struck me, and that's the issue of climate change. Mm. And Rico said, really he said we've got a bi-directional problem with healthcare and climate. <clears throat> one is that the health system's gonna have to cope mm. with a whole lot of new types of cases as a result of, well, let's call it what it really is, global warming. Yeah. It's not hide under climate change, okay? The health system is gonna, and we've seen what happens when the health system copes with a sharp episode, a pandemic, but this is gonna be like the boiling frog, okay? More and more cases, more and more complex cases, more and more severe, complex and chronic, you know, from floods, heat, waves, whatever, is gonna hit the health system. So the health system is gonna have to walk and chew gum at the same time. It's gonna have to deal with its current caseload of age and more aging populations, plus it's gonna to have to deal with all these new kinds of cases that global warming throws up. That's one problem. The second problem, it's, it's bi-directional because the health system itself is responsible for between five and 10% of global emissions. And that's a big problem. So it's almost like a self-reinforcing mechanism, if you think about it as a complex adaptive system, designed for destruction. And yet it's supposed to be solving problems, the health system, and keeping us well. How are we gonna deal with that? Who would like to start? I can do it. You can do it, Adam, of course you can. <laughs> um, simple. <laughs> prevention and shifting away from acute to prevention will help us reduce the amount of waste. Um, it will make it easier to support virtual care and it will make it possible to be resilient to events that happen more frequently because it will reduce the load on acute care where most of those things are gonna happen. So if there's a bombing, if there's a pandemic, if there's something that needs to be taken up in terms of the load of acute care, um, if more people are healthy longer, then the resources are going to be less in that area. I agree with everything you said, except when you started, you said simple. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's simple. Who wants to continue that? Well, I can tell you okay. something that oh. I had, oh, sorry, David, just, well, just quickly. Louise first, then, then then David, yes. Sorry, David, no, I know it's hard when you're remoting in. Um, I thought it was a really good challenge that Enrico pointed our attention to this morning. And so one of the things that I had said to Enrico in the break is we are hosting MedInfo next year. So the world's intellect of health informaticians are coming to Australia in July. So we won't- The um, other world informaticians <laughs> Oh, they're all coming to, to us because, yeah, they yes, want to yes, hang yes, out right. with you guys. Um, so they're coming here, right? So, um, and yes, I do have a role where I can make certain decisions that I don't need to ask anyone for permission. So there's, there'll be a keynote panel. Should there be a workshop? Um, you know, because we can have a call for papers and if there's ones on climate change, great. 
done, created, but we can actually challenge the audience. So I'd already flagged with Enrico, right, what, what should we do at Medinfo and, and try and start working our way through these problems? And just to help you, in one prepared earlier by Kai, Enrico and Farah are editing a special issue of Jamia yes. on uh, just this, climate change and informatics. Right. So they're going to deliver a platform to you. <laughs> Wendy? I think David. David. Oh, David was, David was next. He was. David. I was. That's right. Um, so look, I, I didn't get COVID in Australia. I happened to, I'm pretty sure I got it on the plane back from the UK. Uh, but while I was in the UK, I, I actually met or heard the um, Chief Sustainability Officer for the NHS talk. Uh, who is looking at how they actually reduce their, uh, the climate impact of health services in the UK. Um, firstly, he's an Australian from Perth. And uh, secondly, he was passionate. And it'd be a great speaker, Louise, for Medinfo if we want to chase him down. Um, uh, but some of the things they are doing in the UK, again, uh, the NHS you know, can be quite inventive. Uh, and there's whole health systems which are now replacing their ambulance fleet with battery powered um, you know, ambulances and, and things like that. And, um, uh, and, and the cost saving um, you know, pays for itself. So, so firstly, you know, our health systems should be looking at how they can become more sustainable and they'll probably find that the cost savings in doing that um, you know, it does pay for itself. So the health can, as an industry, we can actually be doing our part in, um, you know, reducing the chances of, of um, reducing the severity of, of uh, global warming. Um, secondly, uh, I think, I think um, uh, Jeffrey, this is a great example for a learning healthcare system. Um, and, and when we were earlier talking about, um, you know, the problem of, of so much knowledge and things like that, there's always an 80-20 rule, I think, in, in these things where 80% of cases are, are more or less the same and it's the 20% that we, we really need to um, learn from and, 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 and offer lots of challenges. And that's where um, you know, we should be, be looking a bit like what happened in COVID, right? There were networks of, of clinicians sprung up which looked at the issue of the AstraZeneca um, uh, blood clots and, and you know, what, what can we do about that and how do we, we deal with that? And that knowledge got disseminated across Australia really quickly. Yeah. And so I think if we can plug into those networks um, and, or, or somehow make those networks of people who are identifying the effects of climate, sorry, global warming on, on healthcare and, and get that knowledge out, then that's really important. So, so there's multiple things we can be doing. Thank you, David. Anybody else want to speak on climate? Because we'll move away from that, not having solved the problem, but, uh, and maybe take some questions, some Q&A from the audience. I've got Peter Brooks. Thanks. Look, this has been terrific. Um, but can I, I, I'm, this is a comment, not, but I'm slightly irritated, OK? And the issue is that we haven't really uh, engaged with patients. We haven't got any patients. There's no patients on the panel. Um, we know what to do. We've got a broke system. Uh, we all know that. And we're going to throw more money at it. And if it's ambulance ramping, we had an editorial in the paper in The Age last week, and it was all about ambulance ramping and hospitals. It's not about hospitals. It's about the community. And each one of you have, have uh, provided solutions, whether it's a learning, um, whether it's a, a, a learning organisation, whether it's um, getting into prevention, um, all of that sort of stuff. It's not about hospitals, but we, unless we engage with patients, we're not going to get there. Adam was interesting because the one thing you didn't say was we've got to educate patients because unless they know how to use digital stuff. Um, it's not going to. It's not going to work. All we're going to do if we, we throw money at hospitals is uh, uh, and A and E's is, is uh, increase the, link, the the time for for ambulance ramping. Seriously, we know what to do. And there's an exemplar there. Telehealth. You know, we had 20 years of research, and nobody took any notice of it until COVID came along. It was implemented in in, in uh, two weeks, and now it's going to stay. Thank God. And. So luckily, people realise that it's not telephone um, telemedicine. It's actually it's actually, actually uh, having uh, uh, viewing as well. 
Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. I, I really think you should... I'm going to put that to the panel. Comment. Okay. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. And we've got a question up there, but just hold on, because where's the patient? Can the patient drive the disruption or the transformation, if you want to use that word, um, to where you've said you would like for us to go? Yeah. Absolutely. And um, I, I agree. And thank you for raising that point. Um, so that is critical to what we do. And I don't and I think I've never met a health informatician researcher or practitioner that isn't engaged in their work because they want to improve health outcomes. So, you know, at the beginning, I was saying we need to do better at getting what we do out there. It's not just to influence government and procurement, but also to do what we can do to work alongside consumers because most people generally as a consumer has no idea what's available to them. Most people don't realise they can actually have a discussion with their GP and say, I don't want a phone consultation, please. Turn your video camera on. I pay for Medicare out of my taxes. I want you to put your video camera on, please. We don't empower people to have those conversations and we can certainly do better. The radical version of what Peter said, I agree, but the radical version of what Peter said though was, that's got to be the starting point. We yeah. did talk a lot. My questioning and your responses were mainly about providers and how we set up the system mm -hmm. to be better. We didn't start with the patient. And I think Peter's chastening us a bit mm -hmm. and saying to us, where is the patient please? And how come we didn't start with the patient? Yep. And I think that's the fault of David Hansen. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do, Jeffrey. <laughs> do you have a comment, David? Uh, only to totally agree. And, um, and so whether that's um, uh, involvement in you know, designing new health services, you know, uh, um, and, and look, we're, we're really lucky, I think, um, now that there are patient groups and, and, um, and, and most of the state health departments and others have, have, have patient engagement um, uh, groups that we can call on to, to really um, not provide input, really drive what we're trying to do, and I hope you know, and, we, and we need to be listening to them on, on where the patient needs to be um, uh, uh, needs to be involved. And I think uh, you know the, 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 it's rather interesting hearing the telehealth um, consult um, discussions on the news because. You know, if, if you want a long consult by video is fine. It's just not by telephone. So I totally agree with Peter on that one. So I've been at lots of things over the last, say, 10 years, and every time Peter Brooks has been in the audience, he's always raised this point. You've talked a lot about whatever you've talked about, but not enough about the patient. So is it because informatics has become so technical? We kind of think we're doing it for the patient, but the real answer is, to give the patient sufficient power, information, capacity to be able to drive the change we want to. Claire? Um, that's such a great summation. I think the problem is that the current consumer provider model was set up when our burden of disease was acute and intermittent. When the actual injury or reason that the consumer sought care was um, dire and could be fixed. We're now in an era of preventable, non-communicable diseases where the consumer can't suddenly go to a doctor and be fixed. And actually the consumer requires empowerment with data, uh, requires empowerment with education to become activated and monitor and prevent their own illness. And that is a massive shift in the way that the consumer provider paradigm has evolved, but it is one that needs to happen to be clearly articulated and underpinned by informatics, because information is power. Thank you. I agree with that. What's going to drive it? Um, I had someone here ask me or, t or tell me and my husband, oh, you guys are so American. And we're like, oh, what do you mean? <laughs> you said, are. Americans <laughs> think they have so many more rights than Australians oh. have. <laughs> and I, I was kind of flabbergasted moving here at the lack of patient demand for their data and at the inability for us as patients to even have access to our data. And I've just been, I'm just trying to figure out where that patient voice is. And I know it's all tied in with culture and healthcare being government yep. and government being big brother and all kinds of things. And I don't quite understand it, but what's gonna drive that patient leading this charge here? I don't know. 
Isn't, isn't it kind of counter to what we talked about before? So we were talking before about um, using our best evidence to make decisions about how the healthcare system should look. Who's to say that, that patients, even when activated, are going to provide the best level of evidence to support the decisions that we need to make at, at fundamental levels about how to deliver care and how to make sure people stay healthy in the community? And on top of that, I also worry that the people who are going to be patients, who are going to be activated, who are going to be um, um, proactive, and who are going to have all of the skills that they need to be able to engage with healthcare decision making, are not the people who are most in need of the access to healthcare. I worry about um, global health. I worry about the gap. I worry about all these other things. And I, I don't see that in professional consumers. And yet it has to be that way, because it's mm. not our system. Mm. It's their system. Mm. Yep. So we've got to be smart and figure out how to put patients in the driver's seat. Mm. Let's take a second question, and this will be the last question, and then we're going to wind up. Uh, thanks very much, Jeffrey. Sorry, I'll try and ignore the uh, echo. I wanted to come back to the issue of uh, health professional education and training, in particular Dr education and training, and maybe a segue is we need our patients to tell us what future doctors should look like, what do they want from future practitioners. Um, I completely agree with your take, Claire and Wendy, that the future doctor needs to look really different. Yep. I look around though and I see not just a medical establishment, but a medical education establishment. So people with lots of vested interests, whole infrastructures, how do we break that down? Because that outcome you're describing requires change now. Yep. Thank you. I want to take that as a comment, which gives us time for one more question, and I think we can squeeze that in. Thank you. That's a very useful point. Uh, we need to record it so we... We have you for posterity. Thanks very, thanks very much. Um, in order to realise the benefits of digital health and learning health systems, how do, we, how do we create a framework and a culture that retires low-value healthcare? Yeah, and we haven't been very good at that. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of care that's marginal at best. Some just shouldn't be done at all, and there's a lot of duplication, test results that never get seen, all the usual stuff that's low-value or even no-value. Comments? You've all thought about this at various times. Start with you, David. Oh, I think there's a health literacy thing happening across a lot of these questions. Um, and the problem is, I, I think as Claire alluded, that most, most people who, who historically have interacted with the health system have done so on an acute basis. So they have an acute episode, it gets solved, they go away and, and, and it's not until the next um, time that there's an acute episode or they go to the GP for a single thing that they interact. It's, it's the people who are interacting with the healthcare system all the time um, and, and as we get more of those with chronic diseases where I think we can really learn um, you know, how, how we actually do deliver health services that people want. Um, but then on the flip side, and I'm going to be a little um, out there here, is that um, you know, we, we've got problems, and we already see it, with health workforce, um, whether that is uh, enough doctors or enough nurses or whatever, and that's a gap where digital can play a difference. So how do we actually think about delivering health services digitally, you know, where, where uh, and Jeffrey, maybe we replace some of the low value care with purely digital services so that people still feel like they've had the opportunity, it, it gets reviewed and sometimes gets promoted to a doctor or a real person. But there's lots we can do, and I would say the AI word, uh, with artificial intelligence with all the data that we're collecting and to be thinking about new ways of delivering health services. And um, uh, so I think we're going to start to see a lot more of that sort of um, health service just because out of necessity. We just don't have enough workforce. I think that's necessary, David, but isn't it insufficient? I mean, don't we have to stop people doing stuff to patients that yes. they get paid for, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that no, they're incentivised to do? We, we you want it to be controversial? System. I'm making a no, no, I totally agree. I, I 
I had a, 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 a recommendation to have a test, uh, to have a procedure on my elbow, actually, and I went and read the Cochrane review and it said, don't what, not waste your money. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, you know, that's the, um, until we, you know, start looking at the latest reviews and, and maybe that's how we, we do turn off some of the low value care is by looking at the meta reviews and, and saying, you know, we, we have to have a, a, have a threshold here. That's fantastic, but that's you, David. You can go and spell Cochrane, look it up, and decide what it is. Yep. And you're pretty digitally enabled to be able to do that. I worry about all the other people who can't. Yep. We're going to reach final observation shortly. Anybody want to talk about this low value care before we uh, have a final sign? Just a quick comment, Gruen Transfer. So a lot of you would watch that show on ABC and I love it. It's really good if you haven't checked it out, please do so. Um, and it's about marketing and how we are sold messages constantly and how it changes our perceptions and how we make decisions. Why are we partnering with the marketing people? Because they know how to sell a message. When I first, uh, into this field and discovered 10 to 15,000 people a year die every year in the Australian healthcare system by accident. And we have this thing called adverse events. Blew my mind and I was like, oh my God, when everyone knows this, <laughs> we will, there'll be changes. And of course, no one's gonna write headlines like that in the front page of the paper to say, by the way, the best thing you can do is stay out of hospital. Um, and, and also we don't, wanna, we don't want people to think that the healthcare sector is not, is, you know, you're getting substandard care on purpose, but you are, and it's not good enough. So how do we sell that message in a positive light with carrots and sticks to raise the awareness? And I think we need to be talking to people who specialise at that, and that's not us out there. Com on the Where do you thing to think about? Um, Adam Elshaw spoke to us recently about low value care, and he's created these dashboards to be able to measure it and show physicians and you know, compare them against others. But what was really surprising to me was he showed the same physician who works in multiple health services and their variation just across themselves depending on which health service they're in. So you can see it's, it's something cultural and, and what's allowed at certain health services. And I wanna um, poke the bear a bit that uh, a lot of low value care is because patients demand it. Because? Patients demand it. Yep. Sure. And so how can we really create that better relationship between a patient and a clinician where they're learning together and talking together and making decisions, informed decisions together? You're right, but it begs another question. Why do patients demand it? <laughs> what's the education process or what's, what's in the community mm -hmm. that, that stimulates patients to demand things? Mm -hmm. Claire? Mm -hmm. um, I think to decide if we're delivering value or not, we need to know the outcome. Mm -hmm. And Australia has been measuring healthcare by throughput, not output. Mm. So if we can shift to monitoring outcomes and understanding what they are and the value they deliver, rather than counting episodes of care, I think we have a chance to understand what value is and educate everyone. Because as Drucker tells us, what's measured matters and outcomes at the moment are poorly measured and so don't matter. So that suggests we get to 10 years and we look back and say, we're running a complex adaptive system. Remember back in 2022 when we didn't measure outcomes and feed it back into Correct. the system? What were we thinking? Yes. Would be good, wouldn't it? Adam? <laughs> I agree with all of those and I think, you know, having access to data is obviously the most important one for being able to measure outcomes properly. I guess um, on a small note, uh, I think that um, explainable AI is a really nice way of standardising decision making that, that um, doctors and other health professionals make. Um, if they're able to see the advice from an AI, then they are able to standardise the decisions that they make for each of the patients that they see. Okay. I'm going to draw this to a close. Panel, I'm giving you 15 seconds notice that I'm just going to ask you one bullet point at the end. What would you say after you think about the whole day and what we've just discussed in the last hour? Have you got any final comments or observations to researchers, policy makers, the system, your pet, <laughs> meme, whatever that might be? Let's start with David. Wow, aren't we lucky to be working in such a great area at the moment? <laughs> Thank you, David. That's, I should have kept you till last. 
Louise? Things are changing for the positive. I was in a meeting with uh, a bunch of universities recently and telling them about the workforce programs and what we're doing about upskilling the workforce. And the feedback, usually it's been not interested or like, you know, that, that's you guys over here. I'm, I do nursing over here or doctoring over here. And the, the, the feedback from every single university in the room was, you're not moving fast enough. We need this information now. We want to cha start changing our curriculums now. I thought that was really positive. Wendy? I'm really interested in how we can do more collective impact. And so we're all working on these things, but we don't have these measured, you know, shared outcomes that we're all looking at and ways of, of measuring them and communicating so that we can show, show that and work together. I don't know how to do it, but I think it's the right approach. Thank you. Very good. Claire? Um, I think that information is healthcare. And so I think we've talked a lot around how information connects providers and consumers, how it connects providers. And I think now we need to use that information to create better outcomes. Adam. I'm optimistic about the future. I think in the last two years, we've seen breaking down of many of the silos that have existed in Australian health informatics. Um, and I love the fact that we're all able to get together in a room and discuss ways forward. Yeah. Thank you. I'll draw this to a close. Thank you to the panel. <laughs> and to you, the audience, I've decided you're not desperate and dateless, you're dedicated and driven. 